Welcome everyone. Uh, we're back again for our Working AI series and today we're talking about knowledge graphs. And I have Rob Stetz, um, an engineer who focuses on knowledge graphs with me today. Do you want to give a, a quick intro? Yeah, certainly. Um, as Joey mentioned, my name is Rob Stetz. I've worked here at Glean for the last year and a half and I've been working on Glean's knowledge graph and helping to extend the graph. Uh, prior to Glean, I worked at Google for a while in the search infrastructure area. I worked on some of Google's knowledge graph and then infrastructure for helping us deliver you know, highly ranked pages through the system with low latency. Um, so I've, I've always kind of gravitated towards positions where I um, have a, one foot in the infrastructure world helping us build effective things and then the other foot in algorithms trying to help figure out how to do search and you know, things like chat very well. Well, great. Well, thank you for joining. Um, as you're well aware, knowledge graphs are, are having a resurgence. We've also seen popularization of graph rag, which is bringing kind of graph-based structures into retrieval. Um, and I'd love for you to just take a step back and explain for everybody what is a knowledge graph and, and why is it so beneficial? Yeah, certainly. Um, yes, um, knowledge graphs are, are largely, largely consists of um, a set of entities and relationship between those entities. And by entities, what we mean is um, kind of artifacts in the real world. You know, it can also, it can be people or documents. Um, it can be also things that have important meaning to the enterprise, like individual OKRs. Um, and then relations connect these, connect all of these entities together. And the um, important thing about knowledge graphs is that it actually makes the relations, the entities and relations machine readable. So we can form these relations and the entities. Um, we can put this onto our online system and then access it very quickly whenever we need to serve queries or answer chat requests. Awesome, that's very cool. Given you know how advanced LLMs have become, like what is the need for a knowledge graph structure with with retrieval. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've struggled with this myself. I, I when I worked on knowledge graphs um, prior, it was before LLMs, and and so knowledge graphs had a, a very distinct position in kind of the search solution at that stage. Um, they did question answering very well. Helped us with uh, question answering, like answering questions like what is the score of the Giants game or. Um, so LLMs, as we know, can do a lot of this today. Um, they, they do have um, you know, some shortcomings in you know, always answering factual queries, like, um, well, I should say answering factual queries, especially in the enterprise space. Um, you know, we're working with foundational models that are trained on public data. And so the enterprise's private data needs to be injected on the side, as you mentioned with RAG techniques. And um, the LLMs have to parse the natural, it's typically natural language in the in documents um, and then come up with an answer. You know, they can make mistakes, but LLMs are getting better. But where, where knowledge graphs actually provide an advantage is in more complex information needs. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by complex information needs? Yeah, sure thing, sure thing. These are our places where to get the right information, we have to do like kind of inherently a multi-step process. So um, a good example that, that I like is, um, say that we ask, um, someone asks our Glean system to give me the status of um, project OKRs for project X mm -hmm. and um, you know what this involves is you know figuring out what the OKRs are for project X it involves then you know if it's an engineering team going into all the code changes going into all the document changes relating those back into the actual OKRs and then you know writing out a good summary which LLMs ex excel at the um, first steps, though, of like following all those different steps, oftentimes they're sequential, and um, compiling the information, it's very hard just for a one-shot LLM. It can't really construct a single search that gathers all of that context. And so this is where the knowledge graphs come in. They, um, we can build knowledge graphs that connect data across silos and express complex you know, um, multi-step relations. So like with this query, um, you know, give me the OKR status of Project X. Um, you know, inside of our knowledge graph, we have, we have lists of projects. 
We also have the people that are associated with those projects. Um, you know, from there, we also have code locations um, for the projects. Um, we have the OKRs too. With that information, we can quickly query all of the context that we need to just provide into the LLM, and then it can do you know a great job of summarizing all of that information for us. Yeah. So it sounds like LLMs are pretty good today at more simplistic queries, mm -hmm. um, like factual lookups, especially if the information is you know, located nearby. and mm -hmm. um, But if there's much more complex reasoning, especially as you see in the enterprise, kind of making inferences across kind of different teams, different types of work, et cetera, that's where you're still seeing some str some, some struggles with those yeah, LMs and, exactly. and where kind of a, a knowledge graph structure, especially the fact that you can do it offline and bring it in at, you know, at runtime can be very, very helpful from a latency perspective. And I think, latency and cost are very closely related, also yeah. from a cost perspective. Definitely, it's probably good point. A lot, a lot more efficient too. Mm -hmm. You've, you know, I can't wait for the end of this conversation where mm -hmm. I'm sure you're gonna show me a demo of how this all works. Yeah. But before we do that, I, I thought it'd be really interesting for you to just talk a little bit about the changes you've seen in kind of building these knowledge graphs between Google, which is very much in the consumer space, to bring it into Glean, where, where you're building them in, in an enterprise environment, where mm -hmm. I'm sure the scale of data looks very different, as well as the security yeah. and privacy. Concerns. Yes, yeah, it's it is a very different, um, very different challenge set of challenges that you have, um, and it stems largely from the privacy uh, sensitive nature of enterprise data. Um, you know, in a, a public knowledge graph, you've got one data set you're looking at, you're working with, and you can look at all of it. And that helps you actually reason about the algorithms you need to build it. Um, in the enterprise, you know, first off, uh, the way we run at Glean is, you know, privacy is first class everywhere. And so every customer has their own segregated deployment. And so, um, you know, we actually end up building in different knowledge graphs, you know, one for each of the customers. Um, also, you know, because this is privacy, um, because this is enterprise uh, data needs to be kept really private, you know, we can't be looking at the enterprise data to reason about things. We have to really be able to just understand our algorithms at a fundamental level, you know, so that we can, you know, create good algorithms that work in a scalable manner across all these customers. Um, so it, it takes, um, I think, a little bit of experience having worked with, um, First, enterprise data. This is something that we leverage here at Glean, um, of course, because we've got six years of experience, you know, developing search. And so we've developed techniques for, you know, dealing with the situation where, you know, the data has to remain private. Um, you know, and second then, um, We've also kind of extended a, a conventional knowledge graph um, to be able to accommodate fine grain uh, data, uh, fine grain access control. Um, you know, um, many typical knowledge graphs are expressed as what people call a triple. You know, they have a subject, a predicate, and an object field. And you know, an example of this, like a subject, might be that project X I mentioned. You know, and um, one of the um, predicates may be code location, and then you know, there's an object, uh, Java.com, Glean, Knowledge Graph. Um, you know, what we've done is extended triples to it's it's a straightforward extension, but we've extended triples to quads so that we can add an extra ACL field that can be attached directly to facts in the knowledge graph, and you know, it's um. All of these um, nuances that you have to actually really, you know, carefully consider um, with regard to privacy, you know, just increases the challenge a little bit of building these graphs. Well, I, I'm sure you know, coming from Google and then going to Glean and having to face these new enterprise, these new challenges in the enterprise is is kind of interesting, um, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully a great learning experience. Um, Definitely. But to close, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about how we're bringing the knowledge graph technology into the Glean user experience. Could you hmm. maybe share an, an example for me? Yeah, certainly. I'll go back to the OKR status example that I started with because it personally resonates with me. <laughs> you know, um, um, it, you're working in engineering teams and trying to um, be able to deliver results very well, and you know, it's very important to move quickly. Um, you know, one of the things you always have a question on is like, how are we doing against our goals? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, prior to um, you know this new world we 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 are in, where you know there's better understanding of artifacts, natural 
natural language and you know tools at hand. Um, you know, this was a real painstaking process to figure out how we were actually how a team was actually doing against um, its goals. Um, and also, it was more important, you know, um, yeah, yeah, not always really accurate because it just involved a lot of um, um, uh, data collection from individuals and such. And, um, you know, people have different views on, on um, how things are actually going. And, and so this would always influence the data gathering. I'm sure recency bias is a big thing here, too. That's a great example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah recency bias. Uh huh. Yeah, so you know this OKR status agent that you know we've been building um, you know, is really useful to me, and you know the way this is working in more detail is um, you know our knowledge graph, as I mentioned, has project information, people, um, artifacts like OKRs, and code location. So with this information, we're able to do a multi-step uh, automated process where you know, we, we know what people are involved in a project, we can gather all of the work that they've done, you know, whether it's docs, writing documents, um, um, you know, working and meeting with um, uh, partner teams or you know, writing code. And then we're able to um, collate all of this stuff and you know, up-level the artifacts to you know, relations with the OKRs. Um, the OKRs are also in the graph. Um, through this process, then we can really get at the ground truth, and we can map these things directly to OKRs. Um, that's really valuable in and of itself. But but there's this other point for it that's really helpful for um, you know, anybody that's actually running a team. Um, as folks will know, um, there are always unexpected pieces of work that pop up during during a quarter, and um, one of the challenges in executing effectively is always you know, trying to understand when there's too many unexpected challenges and you know, maybe it's better to actually go and address things in a more fundamental way so that we can get back to working more efficiently on the OKRs. You know, I, um, it's always been hard to like detect these things at, in a timely manner. So you know, one of the things our OKR agent does, which is really important is, it looks at all of the work and actually it makes decisions about whether some of the work is related to the OKRs or not. And it reports the work that's not related to the OKRs. And so this has given us valuable insight about us you know, facing too many production problems with like the database size. And you know, it's, it's caused us actually to retrench um, during the middle of the quarter and um, you know, spend a week doing some fundamental work that then cleared up a lot of bugs that would have been coming for the rest of the quarter, allowed us to get back into, you know, the productive OKR work. And, uh, you know, again, I don't think we would have had this visibility in our moderate sized team w without this type of really ground truth reporting. Yeah, well, it, it's awesome to hear. I mean, I can see how great this is as an asset, especially as we're ourselves going into our next quarter here at Glean yes, yeah. um, and coming up with what did we do in the past quarter and, and what should we be prioritizing for next quarter again. Mm -hmm. um, so awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today and, and thanks everyone else for listening in. I hope you have a better understanding of knowledge graphs and some of their uniqueness in enterprise environments uh, after this working AI session. Take care.